Okay, well, welcome back, everyone. It gives me a great pleasure to chair this next plenary session for the conference um, with two wonderful papers that I'm sure are going to intersect in all sorts of interesting ways. Our first speaker this afternoon is Professor Jeffrey A. Bell. Um, Jeff is Professor of Philosophy at Southeastern Louisiana University, uh, but this year he's going to be a Leverhulme Visiting Professor right here at Royal Holloway University of London. Um, Jeff uh, is a figure who will be well known to many of you. He's written and edited several books on Deleuze, on the history of philosophy, and on the relationship between analytic and continental philosophy. And one of his most recent books is A Critical Guide to Deleuze and Guattari's What is Philosophy? Jeff is currently at work on his next book, Truth and Relevance, an essay in metaphysics and politics, which will be published by Edinburgh University Press. And today, he's going to speak to us on Deleuze and infinitism. Thank you, Beth. Can you all hear me OK? OK, good. And uh, thank you, Nathan, for inviting me and for organizing this conference. As one who has organized this event before, I know the work that goes into it. And you have done a fantastic job, so, so thank you. Um, today I'm going to uh, talk about a larger project I'm working on that Beth alluded to. And I've got sort of five sort of brief themes from the project I'm working on that I'm going to talk about. Uh, the first theme is the infinite that's at work in Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari's work. I've come across the term many times over the years of reading Deleuze and kind of never really sort of sat down try to figure out what uh, they mean by the term. Uh, so I'm going to go through many examples where that term is used. Then I'm going to go through some classic infinite regress arguments as a way of kind of contextualizing what Deleuze is doing in the, in relative to the history of philosophy. I think that will be illuminating in some important ways. Then third, I will go to infinitism, which is some of you may, when you saw the title, go, what the heck is infinitism? Uh, it's an analytic uh, position in epistemology that doesn't think that infinite regresses are a problem. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about that. And I think it sheds some light on what Deleuze is up to and how Deleuze's approach uh, is, more, is similar to, but very different from, the infinitist approach. And then I will look at um, one of the ways in which the infinite becomes finite for the infinitist, for Peter Klein, who's the one I'll talk about. And also, I think in the context of what I'll be talking about, it'll be sort of the problem of an individuation, right? How infinite speeds become slowed to the point where something finite and determinate can emerge. And that will lead me to the very final section to talk about sort of Deleuze's metaphysics of problems, uh, where I kind of sum up uh, the points that I've been talking about today, and hopefully it'll all tie together. So that's my plan for, for today. So I'll get started on the first section. Uh, throughout Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari's writings, references to the infinite appear at crucial moments in the argument. In his 1954 Empiricism and Subjectivity, for example, Deleuze notes that Hume recognizes how the infinite play of the imagination poses a challenge to thought and action. The depth of the mind is delirium, Deleuze claims, or an infinite play of ideas, a play without constancy, uniformity, and probability. It is this delirium that explains Hume's recurrent use of the imagined example of a, quote, person, full grown, and of the same nature with ourselves, who is on a sudden transported into our world. He would be very much embarrassed with every object and would not readily find what degree of love or hatred, pride or humility, or any other passion he ought to attribute to it." End quote. In other words, with the infinite play of imagination, and thus with no established connection between one uh, impression or idea and another, the result is a delirium that leaves us, as with the person in Hume's example, at a loss of what to do or feel or think. Moreover, this delirium does not simply affect the person who is suddenly transported into our world, but it haunts every attempt to use reason in order to think outside the constraints and limits that habits impose upon us. This is how Hume famously expresses the point in the closing pages of book one of the treaties. Where am I, or what? From what course 
do I de uh, derive my existence, and to what condition shall I return? Whose favor shall I court, and whose anger must I dread? What beings surround me, and on whom have I any influence, or who have any influence on me? I am confounded with all these questions and begin to fancy myself in the most deplorable condition imaginable, environed with the deepest darkness and utterly despaired of the use of every member and faculty. Most fortunately, it happens that since reason is incapable of dispelling these clouds, nature herself suffices to that purpose and cures me of this philosophical melancholy and delirium either by relaxing the bent of mind or by some avocation and lively impression of my senses, which uh, obliterate all these chimeras. I dine, I play a game of backgammon, I converse and am merry with my friends, and when after three or four hours of amusement I should return to these speculations, they appear so cold and strained and ridiculous that I cannot find in my heart to enter into them any further. I tried to go without the reading glasses. That didn't work, so I'm gonna, so, all right. Um, so in his inquiry concerning human understanding, Hume attempts to strike a balance between the thoughtless pursuit of habit and custom, which cures us of our melancholy, and the abstruse thought, as Hume puts it, which leads us down a path to delirium and melancholy. As some of you may know, Hume uh, basically reneged on his treaties and claimed that if you really wanna understand his work, you need to read his inquiry partly because he had a mental, not a mental breakdown, but a nervous breakdown after he finished uh, the treaty. So delirium was something that he had, I suppose you could say, first-hand experience with. To state this attempt in terms that will be important for Deleuze and Guattari, at least as I am formulating it today, the problem is one of accounting for the relationship between the infinite and the finite. Or in Hume's case, the delirious play of an infinite imagination with the practical necessities of daily life. In his 1972 essay on Hume, Deleuze reiterates his earlier point regarding the foundational role delirium plays in Hume's work. On his reading of Hume, Deleuze notes that the mind, if left to itself, has, quote, has the capacity to move from one idea to another, but it does so at random, in a delirium that runs throughout the universe, creating fire dragons, winged horses, and monstrous giants, end quote. What the principle of association, principles of association do, however, is to, quote, impose constant rules on this delirium, laws of passage, of transition, of inference, which are in accordance with nature itself, end quote. In this essay, Deleuze's essay, Deleuze gestures more clearly towards the manner in which the infinite can be balanced with the practical necessities of daily life, and more precisely with the natural partiality of our passions as found in daily life. For example, our partiality, as Deleuze puts it, quote, about our parents, about those who are close to us and like us. So that entails restricted causality, contiguity, and resemblance, right, the principles of association. So the principles of association, in other words, impose upon our passions a tendency to favor those for whom we are closely connected by blood, that is restricted causality, those for whom we frequently associate with, contiguity, Deleuzeans, perhaps, uh, those we find to be like us, resemblance. What the imagination does, Deleuze argues, is to liberate these passions and partialities, st quote, stretching them out infinitely and projecting them beyond their natural limits, end quote. And the role of institutions plays a critical role in, in, in Hume's argument here and for Deleuze as well. Among the various things we encounter in daily life, some are the products of cultural institutions and customs, such as poetry, literature, the law, or even the pre-meal aperitif. And what these cultural institutions do, and with the aid of the infinite play of the imagination, is to reciprocally reinforce a passion that breaks with our natural partialities. These cultural institutions and customs may themselves become ossified and produce the same staid artifacts we become partial to. And hence the necessity of returning to the foundational delirium, to the infinite play of the imagination, in order to connect, correct and counter our natural tendency to become partial and exclusive. We find this theme elaborated and developed in a variety of ways throughout Deleuze and Blues and Guattari's work. In Logic of Sense, for example, while setting forth what is arguably his most important concept, namely sense, Deleuze argues that sense entails a paradoxical infinite regress. In the fifth series of Sense, Deleuze claims that, okay, good, uh, sense is always presupposed as soon as I begin to speak. I would not be able to begin without this presupposition. 
In other words, I never state the sense of what I am saying. But on the other hand, I can always take the sense of what I say as the object of another proposition whose sense, in turn, I cannot state. I thus enter into the infinite regress of that which is presupposed. This regress testifies both to the great impotence of the speaker and to the highest power of language. My impotence, to state the sense of what I say, to say at the same time something and its meaning, but also the infinite power of language to speak about words. A further aspect of this infinite regress of sense is that it simultaneously entails moving in incommensurable directions. More precisely, as the infinite power of language, more can always be said. That which is differentiated with a T can always be further differentiated. At the same time, if what is to be said is to be understood, if it is to make sense, then what must also emerge is a regularity and predictability, something common. Or the infinite power of sense must be narrowed to the routine and common. Sense, Deleuze argues, is paradoxical in that it moves in both directions at once. It is simultaneously moving from more to less differentiated and from less to more differentiated. Deleuze is clear on this point. The power of the paradox, Deleuze argues, is not all in following the other direction, that is, going from least to most differentiated, but rather in showing that sense always takes, us, takes on both senses at once, or follows two directions at the same time. Good sense, by contrast, is said of only one direction, and this direction is easily determined as that which goes from the most differentiated to the least differentiated. Good sense, good sense is therefore given the condition under which it fulfills its function, which is essentially to foresee. As with Hume's efforts to understand how, through cultural institutions and formations, the infinite play of reason and imagination develops and interacts with the finite partialities of daily life, Deleuze is similarly concerned with showing how the infinite regress and paradox of sense comes to be established as good sense, a good sense that always presupposes the infinite series it seeks to stave off. I will return to Deleuze's account of the manner in which sense becomes good sense below, but, I, but first I want to look at one last example of the important role the infinite plays in Deleuze's work, this time in Deleuze and Guattari's 1991 What is Philosophy? In this book, the concept of chaos plays a crucial role in their arguments. And here, too, the infinite looms large in the very definition of chaos. Chaos, Deleuze and Guattari argue, quote, is characterized less by the absence of determinations than by the infinite speed with which they take shape and vanish. This is not a movement from one determination to the other, but on the contrary, the impossibility of a connection between them, since one does not appear without the other having already disappeared. Chaos makes chaotic and undoes every consistency in the infinite, end quote. Deleuze will repeat this point in his final published essay, Imminence, A Life, in discussing the relationship between a transcendental field and the subject and object that are often thought by Husserl, for instance, to be the field's transcendent objects or poles. Deleuze argues that as long as consciousness traverses the transcendental field at infinite speed, everywhere diffused, nothing is able to reveal it, namely the transcendental field. The transcendental field is thus functionally equivalent to Luz and Guattari's understanding of chaos. As a consciousness traversing the, at a field at infinite speed, no determinations are able to be connected, and it thereby becomes impossible to constitute either an object or a subject, both of which would serve to connect and unify the determinations. The problem that results, both in this essay and in what is philosophy, is a problem similar to that which emerged for Hume in his attempt to reconcile delirium with daily life. In this case, the problem is one of accounting for how chaos is related to consistency, or how the infinite speeds, which entail the impossibility of a connection between determinations, becomes a consistency of connected and related determinations. To understand the nature of these problems and to further clarify the manner in which Deleuze addresses them, it is important first to understand how Deleuze understands the infinite. It is this that I now turn, so I now move to section two. To help us in understanding the ways in which the infinite is put to use in Deleuze's argument, I will first place Deleuze's thought in relationship to a position known as infinitism, a position that has been staked out most notably by Peter Klein. He's a professor at Rutgers. <clears throat> 
Uh, the reason for this comparison, as will become apparent shortly, is that both Deleuze and Klein turn away from the standard ways in which the infinite gets put to use in philosophical arguments, most especially in infinite regress arguments. Let us thus begin with a few examples of classic regress arguments. I will give just three of the most famous and consequential examples. The variations run rampant throughout the history of philosophy. The first is from Plato, and what has come down to us, thanks largely to Aristotle, as the third man argument. The third man argument refers to the fact that if we take a man, such as myself, for example, as a particular man, and if we say that I am a man by virtue of the fact that I participate in the essence or form of a man, a form that is itself something that is a man, okay, uh, then there must be a third man or form in virtue of which both I and the initial form are both men. A third man that entails yet another form of man and so on ad infinitum. The reason such an infinite regress is thought to be vicious is that it undermines the attempt to ground our understanding of particulars in simple single essences, for by virtue of the regress, these essences are themselves forever in need of an explanation. Plato was well aware of this regress as evidenced from this passage from the Parmenides. I, Parmenides speaking, fancy your reason for believing that each idea is one is something like this. When there is a number of things which seem to you to be great, you may think, as you look at them all, that there is one and the same idea in them, and hence you think the great is one. That is true, he, Socrates said. But if with your mind's eye you regard the absolute great and these many great things in the same way, will not another great appear beyond, by which all these must appear to be great? So it seems. That is, another idea of greatness will appear in addition to absolute greatness and the objects which partake of it. And another again in addition to these, by reason of which they are all great. And each of your ideas will no longer be one, but their number will be infinite. Not surprisingly, this passage has been the subject of enormous discussion in philosophy. Aristotle, for instance, will resolve the infinite regress by refusing to separate the essence or form of a thing from the thing itself. For Aristotle, the form is not in a relationship with a particular that is distinct from it, but is rather the way in which the particular is. This is a common strategy to resolve the regress, and variations of it can be found throughout the philosophical tradition. David Armstrong and David Lewis are among recent analytic philosophers who have adopted this approach to resolving the regress. Turning now to a second common use of infinite regresses, we find that rather than being used to motivate a foundational move in metaphysics or epistemology, such as the unmoved mover in metaphysics, or brute facts and states of affairs in epistemology, which is the, the position Armstrong stakes out, one can use infinite regresses to reject all such moves. This is the skeptical use of infinite regresses. And its most famous apologist is Sextus Empiricus whose account of Peronian skepticism was to have a, a profound influence, as Richard Popkin has most famously argued for, on early modern thought, an influence that paves the way ultimately to the skepticism we find in Hume. As Sextus Empiricus states the case for skepticism, and more precisely for the suspension of judgment that ought to follow from recognizing that none of our judgments are certain, he claims that the infinite regress is one of the five modes leading to suspension. So he goes through five reasons why we ought to suspend judgment. But one of those fives is, as he puts it, the mode based upon regress ad infinitum, is that whereby we assert that the thing adduced as a proof of the matter proposed needs a further proof, and this again another, and so on ad infinitum. So that the consequence is suspension, as we possess no starting point for our argument. So I'll stop there for a second, because. That'll be a crucial argument in the infinitist position is that if I give you a reason for a position that I hold and you go, well, by what criteria or standard is that reason a good reason? And then I give you a reason for that reason, then you might go on and say, well, what justifies that reason, right? So the, the assumption is that either I have to come to some ultimate unquestioned reason or I can go on forever. So the, 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 the skeptics, such as the Peronian skeptics, think it goes on forever, so therefore they adopt the suspension of judgment position. So as the skeptics will go on to argue, and this point will be important for Klein's infinitism, there is no starting point that is immune to needing an explanation. For skeptics such as Sextus Empiricus, but also for infinitists like Klein, the per burden of proof rests on those like Wittgenstein who would say that there is a point where explanation comes to an end, where one spade is turned, as Wittgenstein famously put it. 
Why is this point not itself in need of an explanation or reason? Why stop there? This brings me to my third and final example of an important infinite regress argument. This time I turn to Bradley, the famous idealist, Bradley's famous regress argument. This argument is pivotal for the emergence of analytic philosophy. We can paraphrase the, paraphrase the regress argument as found in chapter three of Bradley's Appearance and Reality as follows. If you want to explain how a relationship R forms a unity with its relata, A and B, one solution is to call upon another relation, uh, R prime, let's call it, and some, or some special relation A, B, that is supposed to unify R with A and B. This does not explain how R forms a unity with its relata, unless you explain how R prime forms a unity with its relata, R, A, and B. You could try to bring in another relation, R double prime, to unify R prime with its relata, but we are now on a regress. Bradley's conclusion, relations are unintelligible. So a, a simple example is we take the relationship between the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle and the jigsaw puzzle as a whole. Okay? In a series of, of uh, short, artic short articles that Bertrand Russell and um, Bradley wrote back and forth, uh, Bradley would basically claim, why isn't the jigsaw puzzle just the pieces of the puzzle? Why is there some hole that's distinct from the pieces itself? And you can argue, well, if you've done a jigsaw puzzle, well, you can't really do a jigsaw puzzle unless you know what it's supposed to look like, right? The picture of a hole. So you have this hole as a picture that's related to all the pieces, and you look at the picture, at least I do, I'm not a very good jigsaw puzzle. You look at the picture of the hole, and then you go figure out where that piece of the puzzle goes, and so on and so forth. But that's already imposed, implying another relationship, right? Me looking at the whole picture, and then the pieces. And then that's a relationship that needs to be accounted for. What's the relationship between my mind and the pictures of the whole and the pieces of the puzzle? Then for Bradley, that's where the regress gets started. He takes refuge in an absolute idealism. There's only one whole. Um, so what Bradley goes on to argue in contrast to the skeptics is rather than deny the truth to ju the judgments we make about distinct particular things and thus suspend all judgment, he argues that these judgments are mere appearances that have a relative truth to the extent that they express the one absolute reality. To avoid the regress that arises when one attempts to explain how relations form a unity of distinct relata is to deny the reality of distinct relata, which is exactly what um, Bradley will do. Reality is absolute one or whole, Bradley argues, and distinct relata are mere appearances. As Michael Della Rocca has put it, himself a contemporary proponent of Bradley's thought and a well-known contemporary, oh, I didn't put that up before, I'm sorry. Um, and a contemporary proponent of Bradley's thought, the only consistent form of rationalism is one that accepts a form of monism and denies any multiplicity of distinct objects. Few philosophers other than Spinoza, Della Rocca argues, have gone full stop and bit this monist bullet. Bertrand Russell is certainly one who has refused to bite this bullet. To the contrary, to avoid the Bradley regress, Russell simply asserts that some particulars are self-sufficient and in no need of explanation. These particulars have, as Russell puts it, quote, that sort of self-subsistence that used to belong to substance, end quote. In other words, these particulars are not that which needs an explanation, but are that which provide for explanations or for the logical construction of explanations, as Russell will go on to argue. Russell's response to Bradley's regress, coupled with the scientific logical methods used to analyze the relations between particulars, will be central to the emergence of the problems and accepted methodologies of analytic philosophy. As we have seen, therefore, infinite regress arguments have played crucial roles at pivotal points in the history of philosophy. We can now turn to Klein's infinitism and then again to Deleuze, for in both cases, they challenge the presuppositions of the classic regress arguments. So now I turn to section three. According to Klein, there are two principles at work in the classic infinite regress arguments. The first is the principle of avoiding circularity, which Klein states as follows. For all x, if a person s has a justification for x, then for all y, if y is in the evidential ancestry of x for s, that X is not in the evidential ancestry of Y for S. You can tell he's an analytic philosopher. Um, so to take an example from Hume's dialogues concerning natural religion, Philo, Hume's surrogate, challenges accounts such as those where it is claimed, for instance, that, quote, bread nourished by its nutritive faculty, 
senna purged by its purgative, and in like manner, when it, asked, it is asked what causes order in the ideas of the supreme being, can any other reason be assigned by you, anthropomorphites, meaning Cleanthes in the dialogues, than that it is a rational faculty, and that such is the nature of the deity, end quote. In other words, the justification given by Cleanthes, or S in the, the way that Klein formulates it, for X, X being the cause that produces order in the ideas of the supreme being, is Y, Y being the rational nature of the deity. Uh, but this violates circularity because that's simply another way of simply saying that the deity is, is rational, it's, it's circular. The second principle that's at work in these classic regress arguments is what he calls the principle of avoiding arbitrariness. And basically, I, I won't read that because it's, it's too analytic for the moment, uh, but I'll give the Hume example of avoiding arbitrariness. Basically, every reason there has to be another reason. There's, you, there's no stopping point. If you stop, then it's purely arbitrary. Right? The, the assumption is the, the Peronian skeptic assumption that you could always give another reason. Uh, returning again to Hume's dialogues, we find this principle being used against Cleanthes. In response to Cleanthes' argument that one can account for the material world by grounding it in the ideas of God, Philo asked Cleanthes how we can account for the ideal world into which you, Cleanthes, trace the material. Have we not the same reason to trace the ideal world into another ideal world or new intelligent principle? But if we stop and go no further, why go so far? Why not stop at the material world? How can we satisfy ourselves without going in infinitum? End quote. So if the justification for the material world is the ideal world or some reason R1, then if we are to avoid simply stopping arbitrarily at reason R1, there must be another reason R2 for R1 and another reason for R2, and so on, ad infinitum. Okay. So those are some of the classic principles that, that give traction to the infinite regress arguments that justify either foundationalism or skepticism or something along those lines. And you see it, as I hope my examples have shown, you see it throughout the history of philosophy is playing an important sort of founding role in some of what the philosophers do. So with these two principles in hand, infinite regress arguments are then constructed to justify either skepticism, sexist empiricus, or foundationalism, Aristotle's unmoved mover, Russell's self-sufficient particulars, etc. The argument generally takes the following form. First step, all knowledge is the result of reasoning from premises to conclusions. This is the assumption for the reductio. Either the series of premises terminates in a first premise, or it doesn't. This is the key one. If there is no first premise, no knowledge would be possible. This is the premise that Klein and the infinitist will reject. For if there is a first premise, either it has appeared in the series earlier or it hasn't. Okay. So then he goes on and says, if it has appeared earlier, then a proposition is being employed in its own evidential ancestry and circular reasoning has occurred and such reasoning cannot produce knowledge. So if I give you no explanation but circular reasoning, you won't be satisfied with that explanation. Okay? So we want to avoid circular reasoning, but also we want to avoid being arbitrary. Right? We don't want to just assume the truth of what we're trying to explain or justify. Okay? So if both those cases are true, then if all knowledge results from reasoning, and reasoning entails steps and inferences, then there would be no knowledge. Okay? That's the skeptical conclusion. Or, the other conclusion is, there must be some knowledge that's not the result of reasoning. That's where we have the given, the unquestioned starting points, and so on and so forth, or the forms. Any of these sorts of metaphysical assumptions, they're simply taken as foundational for everything that we know. So what Klein's move to infinitism entails is a rejection of the third premise. Namely, the claim that knowledge requires a finite number of premises or reasons. For Klein, there is always another reason to be given, or as he puts it, quote, the infinitist is claiming that a normatively acceptable set of reasons must be infinitely long and non-repeating if we are to avoid the pitfalls of foundationalism, end quote. For Klein, therefore, the reality is that there is an infinite series of reasons and infinite regress but rather than undermining knowledge, as the skeptics argue, or motivating a move to foundationalism to avoid asserting the reality of the infinite, Klein bites the bullet and accepts the reality of an infinite series. With this move, however, we return to the problem we were left with in our earlier discussion of Deleuze. 
namely the problem of accounting for how the determinate and finite can be made possible by the infinite speeds that render impossible the very connections that determinate objects require. For Klein, similarly, the problem is to account for how finite knowledge claims can be justified if the justification one has presupposes an infinite series of further reasons and justifications. An infinite series that is generally thought to undermine and render impossible the very justification one had hoped to attain. So I will now turn to the way both Klein and Deleuze respond to this problem, and in doing so we will find important similarities between Klein's infinitism and Deleuze's transcendental empiricism. But we will also see that there are fundamental differences. And I knew move to section four. Klein's solution was already alluded to at the end of the previous section when it was noted that an infinite series is generally, generally thought to render impossible the ability to justify one's beliefs. Klein refers to this as the finite mind's objection to infinitism. A finite, as finite beings, we cannot run through an infinite series of reasons, and thus we can never fully justify a belief. Adequate justification, therefore, must entail, so it is argued, being grounded in a reason that does not itself require justification. This was, as we saw, Russell's way out of Bradley's infinite regress. Though Bradley himself adopts a form of coherentism, whereby everything is related to everything else, and that they're all appearances of one absolute reality, so it becomes a kind of circular argument. Klein, however, rejects the assumption that an infinite series of reasons undermines having a legitimate justification for a knowledge claim. The assumption that an infinite series does undermine such a claim only works on the basis of a false dilemma, Klein claims, which asserts that either one has a complete list of reasons to justify one's knowledge claim, what Klein calls the completion requirement, or one does not have a legitimate claim to know something. For Klein, there is a third alternative, namely the notion that there may be sufficient justifications or reasons relevant to the circumstances at hand. The key word there is relevant. And one of the motivations behind what I'm working on now why it's called truth and relevance is that Deleuze will often say that what's not important is truth. Relevance is much more important than truth. And so now I'm moving towards the, the, the part of the talk where I'm going to emphasize just what is meant here by relevance. Okay. So to use Klein's own example of relevant circumstances, uh, one's claim that a snowstorm is likely may well be justified if certain objective availability constraints, to use Klein's phrase, are satisfied. And the belief that, quote, dark clouds are gathering over the mountain and it is midwinter Montana, okay, may well satisfy these constraints. What Klein has in mind here regarding objective avail availability constraints is rather straightforward. Among the constraints he lists, he lists seven, uh, there is the constraint that the reason for a particular belief be of sufficiently high probability, and which is another constraint, an impartial and informed observer would also accept the reason given as justification for the claim being made. So the other day we were walking back from, I think, the happy man. Uh, maybe it was the pack, must have been the pack horse. Uh, and we saw dark clouds off uh, in the horizon. So, oh, it's raining there, okay. And we we're like, is it gonna rain here? Okay. Now, I didn't have, not being from Egham, I don't know what the storm weather patterns are here and so on and so forth. And so if, if Nathan had been with me, he might have said, no, the rain always moves away from from here. If it was the other direction, then yes, you would have said it would, would rain. Those are some examples of what he's talking about of objective availability constraints. The claim that is likely to snow would satisfy these constraints if it is indeed highly probable that dark clouds gathering over the mountains in midwinter Montana is evidence for the claim that it is likely to snow. And evidence another impartial informed observer, such as a Montanan, for instance, would also accept as evidence for the claim. In addition to the objective availability constraints, Klein also claims that there are subjective avail availability constraints. There might be a good reason, Klein argues, that is objectively available for us by any person, such as the dark clouds, but unless it's properly hooked up with S's own beliefs, R will not be subjectively available to us. A person unfamiliar with Montana weather patterns may well not make use of a reason that is objectively available to others, that is to Montanans. Much as, we, the plight of, much as was the plight of Hume's imagined person who finds they have been transported to a completely new environment. Klein's arguments here are more complex and nuanced than I have presented them due to lack of time, but the basic point is that although there may well be an infinite series of reasons one could continue to offer, 
At some point, the relevant reasons have been provided, given the context, and a knowledge claim is justified. All that infinitism entails, Klein argues, is the claim that nothing is ever completely settled, but as S engages in the process of providing reasons for her beliefs, they become better justified. Not because S is getting closer to completing the task, but rather because S has provided more reasons for her belief. How far forward in providing reasons S need go seems to me to be a matter of the pragmatic features of the epistemic context. Okay. As a segue to Deleuze's version of infinitism, at least as I understand it, I want briefly to begin bring in what I think is a helpful tangent to, Klein, to clarify Klein's point regarding the pragmatic features of the epistemic context and how these features determine whether the relevant reasons are both subjectively and objectively available. The tangent I have in mind has been the subject of recent work in psychology of reasoning studies. Studies that find a precursor in the work of Alexander Luria, whose 1931 to 32 observations on literate, illiterate villagers in the regions of Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzia provided insights into how different epistemic contexts, literate or non-literate contexts, affect the manner in which one reasons. As Luria interpreted the results of his observations, it was clear that literacy was an important factor in determining how one reasons and categorizes the world. With respect to categorizing, for instance, Luria found resistance among illiterate villagers who, when shown pictures of a hammer, saw, log, and hatchet, were asked which three of the four can be grouped together, hence leaving one of the pictures out. A villager from Yardan, for instance, said, they all fit here. The saw has to saw the log, the hammer has to hammer it, and the hatchet has to chop it. You can't take any of these things away. For those with an education and an ability to read, they would readily exclude the log, given that the other three are all tools and the log is not. The villager apparently lacked the abstract category tool as a way of categorizing their world. Luria found that solving reasoning problems was equally difficult for the villagers. When given the following syllogism, in the far north, where there is snow, all bears are white. Novaya Zemlya is in the far north, what color are bears there? A typical response was either to refuse to make any inferences at all, or add qualifiers, such as pointing out that they had never been in the north and had never seen bears. To answer the question, you would have to ask people who had been there and seen them. The conclusion Luria draws from this and other examples along these lines is that the formal operation of problem solving presents major, sometimes insurmountable difficulties for these subjects. More recent studies have interpreted Luria's observations differently. Sylvia Scribner, for instance, has argued that the reasoning and problem solving skills of the villagers work perfectly well, and the villagers of Luria's studies were simply, uh, Scribner argues, unfamiliar with the closed nature of the formal language genre in which the problems were posed. When given a problem, the villagers set out to create a new set of relations for which the conclusion could be drawn. So for example, <clears throat> when the problem is all people who own houses pay a house tax, Boima does not pay a house tax, does Boima own a house? What Scribner found was that those with more familiarity with the language of formal problems would generally provide a theoretical justification such as, well, if you say Boima does not pay a house tax, he cannot own a house. While those less familiar with the genre would provide an empirical justification. Boima does not have money to pay the house tax, for instance. Familiarity with the formal language genre is not the only factor at work here, however, as Joseph Glick's studies of the Capella tribesmen in West Africa shows. What is equally, if not more important, is the relevance of the reasons to the situation at hand. So again, relevance. When Glick asked the tribesmen to group objects in accordance with abstract categories of food and tools, the tribesmen would instead group the potato with the hoe, the orange with the knife. This observation was in line with Luria's, but out of curiosity, Glick asked them, how would a fool do it? And they promptly grouped the food together and the tools together. Uh, in short, the Capella tribesmen were familiar with the abstract categories of tools and food, but they simply saw these categories as irrelevant to their concerns. They're only relevant to fools. So if we can like, think of our own example. Um, all people who drink beer in this pub are of legal age. James is not of legal age. Does James drink beer in this pub? Now, I'm from New Orleans, as some of you know, and there's some notorious bars where underage people get served beer all the time. And so that's a relevant piece of information that you would probably bring in if given this, this problem. You would probably not, if you're from New Orleans, 
immediately think in terms of a closed world formal uh, problem in terms of, of addressing it. And that's the point here in terms of, of relevance. So with the emphasis upon the relevance of reasons given a particular set of circumstances, we have added some flesh to the bones of Klein's claim that the pragmatic features of epistemic context determine the objective and subjective availability constraints. Moreover, we have also returned to Deleuze's concerns, for Deleuze makes clear the infinite series and paradox of sense is not in another realm separate from the everyday sayings and forms of communication we regularly engage in. As for Klein, this is a false dilemma for Deleuze, and it belies an abstraction from a process that involves both the infinite series and the paradox of sense and the determinate common meanings we grasp when we believe we have understood what another has said. As Deleuze puts it, quote, the gift of sense occurs only when the conditions of signification are also being determined, end quote. In other words, sense only occurs when it is both becoming infinite, becoming more and more differentiated to the point of chaos, and when it is becoming the determinate relation between a signifier and signified. The conditions of signification are precisely what one might call the conditions of relevance. So all that stuff I've been talking about, I think Deleuze would probably be on board. The conditions that make it possible to relate a signifier to a signified, a reason to an inference, a category to a particular. With this, we are now ready to take up Deleuze's account of how the infinite speeds of chaos become the consistency necessary for the givenness of discrete determinant phenomena. So the last section, just a couple pages. In what may appear to be a surprising move, Deleuze follows the leads of both Plato and Kant in his efforts to understand the relationship between determinant finite givens and the infinite series or chaos that becomes them. This is surprising, of course, because for both Plato and Kant, as traditionally understood, the givenness of the determinant and particular is accounted for by virtue of a condition that is itself already determinate, namely the ideas for Plato and the categories or pure concepts of the understanding for Kant. For Deleuze, by contrast, the condition that accounts for the determinant givenness of phenomena a givenness that is identifiable and hence capable of being represented is difference. Deleuze is quite forthright on this point. He begins the fifth chapter of Difference and Repetition, claiming that, quote, difference is not diversity, diversity is given, but difference is that by which the given is given, that by which the given is given as diverse. For both Plato and Kant, therefore, diversity is also given, but given by virtue of identity, not difference. Despite this critical difference between Deleuze's approach and that of Plato and Kant, Deleuze notably ad adopts the use of the Platonic term idea and with a capital I. Moreover, Deleuze adopts the term for the same reason Kant does. As Kant justifies his use of the term, one need not coin new words if there's terms already suitable to the task, Kant argues, and Plato's term idea is suitable, Kant claims, for, and this is Kant, Plato made use of the expression idea in such a way as quite evidently to have meant by it something which not only can never be borrowed from the senses, but far surpasses even the concepts of understanding, inasmuch as in experience nothing is ever to be met with that is coincident with it, end quote. For Kant in particular, idea is the appropriate term to highlight the fact that we can never actually complete the infinite task of surveying the infinitude of conditions for which uh, for that which is given, and thus, for Kant, the absolute whole of all appearances, Kant argues, is only an idea, since we can never represent it in an image. It remains a problem to which there is no solution. It is precisely this sense of an idea as a problem to which there is no solution that Deleuze takes from Kant, and by extension from Plato, too. For the idea as problem is not to be confused with the solutions it makes possible. In other words, for Deleuze, an idea is a problem to which there is no solution in the sense that there is no solution that exhausts or resolves the problem, that makes the problem vanish with a solution. The problem or idea remains inseparable from the solutions it makes possible, much as Plato's ideas remain inseparably related to the particulars that participate in them. As long as we don't confuse problems with simple essences or with an identity that is similar to the identity it conditions, then for Deleuze, as for Kant, the term idea is the appropriate term to use. Deleuze makes this point explicitly in a talk he gave while finishing work on difference and repetition, a talk published as Method of Dramatization, where in response to a question about Plato, 
Deleuze acknowledges that if we think of the Plato from the later dialectic, where ideas are something like multiplicities that must be traversed by questions such as how, how much, in which case, then yes, everything I've said has something platonic about it. If you're thinking of the Plato who favors simplicity of the essence or an ipsaity of the idea, then no. Turning now to Deleuze's account of how the infinite speeds of chaos become determinate, finite solutions in knowledge, the concept of learning becomes the key concept to understanding this process. And this process, moreover, is explicitly connected to the idea as problem. Learning is the appropriate name for the subjective acts carried out when one is confronted with the objecticity, it's l'objectivité in French, of a problem idea, whereas knowledge designates only the generality of concepts for the calm possession of a rule enabling solutions. With this notion of learning in hand, let us recall Klein's infinitism. As we saw for Klein, it is a mistake to assume that either one must complete an infinite task of surveying all the reasons for a knowledge claim, or else one does not have knowledge. Instead, given the relevant uh, reasons for a knowledge claim, uh, instead given the relevant, and the key term here is relevant, objective and subjective availability constraints, one may well have knowledge regardless of the fact that further reasons could be given. For Klein, however, the further reasons that could be given are determinate reasons, a checklist of reasons that one continue, could continue listening if one wanted to, though one would reach a point where one would not do so because of the pragmatic context. For Deleuze, by contrast, the infinite regress of sense or the infinite speeds of chaos is not an infinitude of determinate, already identified elements. It is not, in short, an infinite diversity of determinate elements. Rather, the infinite speeds of chaos, or the gift of sense as paradox and infinite regress, is the condition for the givenness of phenomena as diverse. It is, as we saw Deleuze argue earlier, the difference by which the given is given, that by which the given is given as diverse. And the infinite speeds of chaos become that which is given as diverse through a processual encounter with the objecticity of a problem, or in short, through a process we can call learning. Problems, ideas are not already given, however. Remember, they are the condition on which the, the given is given, but rather they must be constructed. Thus, another difference between Deleuze and Plato and Kant emerges, and it is here where the process of learning becomes especially appropriate in clarifying the nature of the confrontation with the objecticity of a problem. In Difference in Repetition, Deleuze gives two examples. He gives the example of finding food under a box, and he gives the example of learning. And so I could take Example of learning to drive a stick shift car. At some point, I have to bring the elements together. And for it to, to learn, at some point, I have to, it, the, the problem of bringing the elements together has to be constructed before a solution becomes possible. And then at one point, Deleuze says that there's a paradoxical point when the monkey's trying to figure out what colored boxes the food is under, where it's no longer random, but it's not yet knowledge of the rule. That paradoxical period is where we have a kind of consistency a problematic state that is not chaos, nor is it the rule. That's where we end up with the chaos, where we don't have determinate ca connections, and we have the consistency that makes connections uh, possible. So last paragraph, and then I'm, then I'm done. In closing, we can now see how Deleuze's understanding of problems, ideas, entails a rejection of traditional uses of the infinite in philosophical arguments. The infinite is not an unattainable ideal that forever limits our ability to know or do something, and hence, it is not something to be turned away from, as in the efforts we saw to avoid the implications of an infinite regress. Far from being a barrier to knowledge or for achieving something new, the infinite is precisely what, on Deleuze's understanding, allows for the possibility of the new, including new knowledge. A problem idea is thus not an already established foundation or ground, the identity we need if we are to bring an infinite regress to an end. To the contrary, the objecticity of a problem is the infinite, the infinite speeds of chaos have already become relevant. And it is this relevance that allows for the possibility of the new, including new knowledge, new entities, etc. The process of learning, therefore, is not to be limited to or be thought solely in terms of an anthropocentric process, nor even to the processes of problem-solving primates, such as the monkey uh, Deleuze discussed. But in a Whiteheadian, panpsychist vein, learning is the process that is the sufficient reason of all phenomena. In a resonant echo of Deleuze's reference to uh, Plotinus, the, and by saying the sublime words of Plotinus's third Aeneid, all is contemplation, 
we may conclude by saying, all is learning. Thank you. Oh, yeah, you definitely can. Thank you, Tamer. Really wonderfully clear, as always. And so, initially, you um, were implying that there were two conditions one was sufficiency and one was relevance. We spent a lot of time talking about what relevance would look like, and then we connected that to relevance. We didn't talk about sufficiency much, so I have two questions. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then secondly, um, what would sufficiency look like in the world? Is there something equivalent like the sensation? Okay. Uh, that's a big question. But, um, but I, I suppose the sufficiency would be that the, the problems are uh, completely determined, the solutions without exhausting, without the solutions exhausting the problem. So I would say, um, and, and it's, not, it's not a relationship in the, because we, this is where they avoid, I think, the relation of regress that we talked about before. The problem is not something separate from the solutions. The problem appears with the solutions. Um, Deleuze says this on a number of, of, of occasions. The eye is a solution to a light problem, but it wasn't like the problem was there before the eyes emerged as a kind of solution to the problem. So that's the sense in which I think a problem is kind of a sufficient condition, and it's, the, the difference is, is this, I mean, for Klein, and I brought this up because Klein is like, yeah, there, you can go on infinitely, uh, but we don't have to because of the relevant conditions, and I gave those examples. And I think for Deleuze, what's relevant here is the problem, right? It's the problem that's relevant to the, to the solutions that we, and the, and the problem has its own nature, it has its own uh, condition, it has its own constructed uh, aspect to it, and that, in many ways, determines uh, the solutions. Now, as to deduction, uh, I would put that more that Deleuze is not interested in the deductive side of things. I think that already presupposes a closed world uh, form of reasoning. I didn't talk about this in the, in the talk. I barely had enough time as it was, but one of the, the, the arguments among recent psychology of reasoning is that there's a distinction between open re world reasoning and closed world reasoning. And, and as an example of closed world reasoning is that Everything you need to know is in the premises. So in a kind of a classic deductive argument, it's, that would be a closed world reasoning. So everything you need to know about the conclusion is already there in the premises. You don't need to go outside that. Um, but open world reasoning is where, so an example, you go to the train station, there's like a list of trains that are heading off to London, and there's a 2.15 and a 2.30, and you, you ask the conductor, when's the 2.25 train leaving? They'll go, there is no 2.25. That's all there is. Right, so you don't look outside the premises. Open world reasoning is going to be uh, where you bring in all kinds of things outside that might be relevant to the situation. And what Scribner and others have shown is that many cultures, they don't, that, that formal deductive closed world reasoning is a kind of genre of speaking about things. And it's not always in the relevant way to speak about things. So I suppose that would be in its own question. Under what circumstance is it relevant to use deductive Reasoning. That was a long answer to your question. I hope it answered. Uh, hello. Hi. Thank you very much uh, for your paper. Um, I was uh, wondering uh, within uh, history of analytic philosophy, there is uh, modal realism, mm -hmm. um, but I suppose this is a metaphysical question. But infinitism that you're presenting is, uh, is, is an epistemological um, uh, stance, if I'm not mistaken. Do you think there could be a relationship between, between the two? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I definitely do in a much, I mean, you're right, Klein's position is strictly an epistemological <coughs> position on infinitism. But I definitely, in a more expanded version, would argue for a relationship between thought and being, between thought and metaphysics that, that ties in. And also, uh, in another version, I have a discussion on David Lewis's Ontology of Possible Worlds. And actually, Lewis, he also embraces an infinite regress. The, in, 
the, the singleton, which is a very strange concept, is a set that only includes one thing, generates a regress. You have the set of that, set of that, set of that, so on and so forth. But for Lewis, that's good because it creates all of mathematics. Mathematics is made possible by that. So there are some interesting parallels there. So yes, I think it's not, I think you could go in a metaphysics direction as well with Lewis and, and others. No? Hello? There you go. Okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, thank you for your talk, and I also really liked the way you closed. I was, but I was hoping that you would bring up again the problem of infinite regress. Okay. Uh, and because I had somehow, it, it's going into the argument that we somehow can embrace infinite regress, if I didn't misunderstand this. Okay. And the very idiotic question of okay. mine would be just, okay. isn't the problem of infinite regress that it would be okay. a repetition okay. of the same and not a repetition okay. of difference? Thank you. I'm glad you asked that question, because um, at one point Klein says that the infinite regress is not an intellectual puzzle, right? It's, it's really a practical issue. And so uh, and I think similarly for Deleuze, I think there's a tendency to think of the infinite or chaos as something separate as a, kind of, as, a, as a separate realm from the actualized and determinate, uh, those, I think, are both abstractions. When I ended by saying all is learning, I'm, I was serious. All is simply a process. Ab abstractions from learning are things that are learned, determinate rules, solutions, etc. And there is the attempts to make sense of what's there and, and in the determinate. And there's problems already there in the determinate. It's not like We've got these two separate realms. So it's not like we have this infinite series out there waiting to be tackled by a really smart person, and then we, 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 we can get rid of it for, forever. Now, that is kind of Klein's approach, right? Klein does kind of think that there is this sort of infinite series that goes on and on uh, that's out there metaphysically. But for Deleuze, the infinite is not something metaphysically independent of the actual and the determinate, at least not in my reading of what Deleuze is doing. Hi. Um, so I have a question about Deleuze's position in relation to the skeptical position. Okay. So it seems that in Deleuze, the knowledge is always tied to the problem-solution right. complex. So the knowledge afforded by a solution can't be divested from the problem. Right. But since sense is always shifting, the problems themselves shift. Right. So it would yeah. seem that knowledge is never final or definitive. There's no such thing as once and for all we now know this and this can never change anymore or something like that. So yeah. that would seem to, I mean, I guess a skeptic could say, well, that, that's what I've been trying to say all along. So well, would you say that there's still an important difference here, or that we can't see Deleuze as some kind of skeptic about some kinds of knowledge of which he would deny the possibility? I mean, I think, uh, and I think this is where Deleuze is similar to Klein in that Klein, that was his basic summary of what the infinitist position ultimately boils down to. And it's an anti-skeptical position, right? Because the skeptic claims that we can, we can never know anything sufficiently well, so therefore we should suspend judgment. And, and Klein's point is, yes, we can know things sufficiently well. We don't need to suspend judgment. But we need to recognize that it's provisional. There is no ultimate knowledge. There is no final knowledge claim uh, that if we just had enough time, we would figure it all out. I think Deleuze would, would argue something similar. We can never reduce the coming and processes to a static, determinate, final end or, or whole. So I think on that point, for different metaphysical reasons and assumptions behind that claim, I think there would be fundamental agreement on that particular point. So it wouldn't take, I mean, I think this is where maybe a Hume and healthy skepticism, right? I mean, don't, don't, kind of an anti-dogmatism skepticism. Yeah, maybe that kind of a skepticism, but I don't, I don't have a problem with that type of skepticism. 
Very good. <laughs> Getting a workout. <laughs> so I would like to thank you very much for a very interesting and inspiring uh, presentation. My question is um, rather like um, like a thought that came to my mind and uh, to make sure what the, whether it makes sense or not. Because first you were uh, considering the notion of, uh, of infinity according to analytical philosophy. So something that is deprived from the world, let's say <coughs> so, like uh, the distinction between financialism and uh, skepticism. And then I thought for a moment about the, the other solution, like the hermeneutical circle, but it would be something rooted more in, let's say, life as such. Okay. Of course, and then this shift of Deleuze, which is the shift between the, re the truth, which is something like, uh, let's say, eternal or stable to some category of relevance, which okay. might uh, imply the category of life as such as well. So my general question would be, um, uh, you know, Leibniz, uh, as far as that actual infinity may exist in nature as such, and yeah. I don't know, that the, the some discoveries of, co uh, of contemporary cosmology or something prove that there are situations as that. And the less is a philosopher also, uh, 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 he's much upon the category of life as such. So do you, do you think that, uh, just in short, this infinitism, mm -mm, the category of infinities that you were elaborating here would be not only about the knowledge, but about the life as such, because there's the notion of time inscribed, uh, you know, in, in, in the less philosophy as well. Yes, yes. I mean, short answer to your question is yes. Uh, I think so, yes. I definitely, notion of life, I think, is very much important in terms of relevance and so on. I do think, uh, in a broader sense, I'm, I'm hoping to kind of create a sense of, uh, a basis for kind of an ethics and politics in Deleuze, and I think this is where the categories of, of relevance and meaning uh, in further fleshing this out would, would, would come in to play. So yeah, no, I agree. Thanks a lot. So, um, if Deleuze argues that um, in the event the event does violence to thought and sort of stimulates yeah, yeah. Uh, thought in an encounter, in the logic of sense, he then says that events don't exist outside the terms with which they're stated, right. which has led at least one Deleuzean to say that if there were no humans, there would be no events. Um, and therefore no stimulation of thought. So does that mean for you then as a corollary that there are some forms of thought and knowledge, learning, which are foreclosed to humans that might be access inaccessible to us, um, that might not be articulable or learnable in some other way? And I, have, I just have in the back of my mind someone like Miyasu or perhaps even Badu who will argue that you know, mathematics is one way that we might do that in, a, in, in, in some future, but there might be other ways. Yeah. That's a good question. A um, couple of ways of, of answering that. I mean, I guess, again, the short answer to your question is that yes, there are, uh, um, our knowledge is always limited and, and conditioned by the problems to which our knowledge is, is, is a solution. Uh, but also that's why the very closing lines I made reference to kind of a Whiteheadian panpsychism. Right? I, I don't think learning is purely uh, a human phenomenon. I don't think events are only things that humans encounter. I think uh, they are, it's, I mean, I think Deleuze is deadly serious when he says, when he embraces the all is contemplation quote from uh, Plotinus. And he talks about contemplative souls in plants and all these various other phenomena. So I, I and, and uh, inorganic life, I think, is a, is, is a concept as well in which you would see similar things at work. So I think learning is something that would be a kind of a metaphysical thing. And therefore, that would entail encounters and processes of which our learning in the relevant context is very different. Um, just recently read a book, uh, Other Minds. It's about octopus or octopi. I don't know how that, uh, very fascinating book. And it really tries to kind of get in sort of what's going on with octopi. Uh, and uh, and, and, and in, so, yes, I would say that there are other ways of learning that we have no clue about. Excellent. I think we'll finish on that point. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs>
she you has it the up there. And she's, I think it's right there. There we go. Yeah, so this is off. Do you want this? second speaker this afternoon in this plenary session is Dr. Daniela Voss. Daniela is Associate Lecturer in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Hildesheim, and she's the author of Conditions of Thought, Deleuze, and Transcendental Ideas. Um, that's out with Edinburgh University Press, and I should perhaps stress again that you can buy both Daniela's book and Jeff's book out at the EUP stand um, after, the, after the papers today. Um, Daniela is also co-editor with Craig Lundy of At the Edges of Thought, Deleuze, and Post-Kantian Philosophy, and she's going to speak to us today on the problem of method, Deleuze, and Simondon. Okay, thank you very much, Beth, for the introduction. And I would also like to thank Nathan for organizing the event, um, the camp, and the conference. And it's a great honor to be here and to speak to you as a keynote speaker. It's the first time for me, so it's a very exciting event. So, yeah, my talk is on the problem of Method, Deleuze, and Simondon. Deleuze held the philosophy of Gilbert Simondon in high esteem, as can be seen in his 1966 review of Simondon's book, L'Individu et sa jeunesse physico-biologie, in which he claims that, I quote, few books can impress a reader as much as this one can, unquote. Traces of Simondon's thought can be found throughout Deleuze's work, in particular in difference and repetition and in the logic of sense, but also in his joint work with Félix Guattari, where Simondon's critique of hylomorphism is cited with approval. Deleuze and Simondon have much in common. They both advocate a conception of pre-individual being that is freed from the shackles of unity and identity, a science of the individual that no longer classifies it according to generic and specific differences, but through spatial-temporal dynamisms a primacy of difference and disparation, which is presupposed by all other states, and a notion of the problem endowed with an objective sense. However, according to Deleuze, the special importance of Simondon's book lies in its presentation of, I quote, a new conception of the transcendental, unquote. A claim that might have taken Simondon by surprise, since the notion of the transcendental appears only once in the whole book. It's a book of roughly 600 pages. In the last chapter, he talks about the transcendental um, and he discusses there the collective as a condition of signification. What does Deleuze mean by this claim? How can Simondon's philosophy have served as an inspiration for the transcendental empiricism that Deleuze develops in difference and repetition? This paper will show that Simondon himself could not have gone in the direction of constructing a new transcendental philosophy in the Deleuzean sense, due to his philosophical method and its implications. It is precisely in terms of method where the greatest divergence between the two thinkers is to be found. What this difference ultimately reveals is that the nature of Deleuze's adherence to structuralism and the dialectic of ideas at this stage of his work. So this is the, um, the outline of my presentation. I will first talk um, a little on Simondon's theory of individu individuation. And those of you who were at the camp, I'm sorry, there will be a little bit of repetition. Please bear with me. And 
the second section will be on the traces of Simondonian thought that can be found in difference and repetition. And then the last section I will talk on the problem of method. In his review on Gilbert Simondon from 1966, Deleuze praised Simondon's, I quote, profoundly original theory of individuation, implying a whole philosophy, unquote. And he claims that, quote, the new concepts established by Simondon seem extremely important. Their wealth and originality are striking when they are not outright inspiring, unquote. Simondon's inquiry into the nature of individuation <coughs> attempts to grasp the genesis of individuals through operations of individuation and not by presupposing some prior principle of individuation. According to Simondon, the very notion of a principle is already flawed. It tends to leave unexplained or mask the real operations of individuation. <coughs> it proposes what it is supposed to explain. For <coughs> instance, the ancient theory of atomism explains the constituted individual as a compound of pre-existing individual atoms and thus fails to account for the genesis of individual atoms. Or, in the case of the Aristotelian model of hylomorphism, one divides the unity of the concrete individual <coughs> into its essential elements of composition, form and matter, but leaves obscure the processes involved in taking on form. The fundamental mistake in each case is to start from the already constituted individual and to consider it as the final reality to be explained. Such an approach fails to provide a true account of ontogenesis, that is, of the becoming of being. Simonon's approach to this problem consists in studying particular cases of physical, biological and psychosocial individuation discussed in the scientific literature. As Deleuze acknowledges, I quote, Simondon demonstrates the extent to which a philosopher can both find his inspiration in contemporary science and at the same time connect with the major problems of classical philosophy, unquote. <coughs> Simondon draws the basic material for his theory of individuation from chemistry, the study of the conditions of crystallization and the cybernetic theory of information, so the study of the transmission of information through the modulation of electrical currents. Crystallization serves as a paradigm case of the resolution of a metastable system. So I just put up a few definitions um, that, that Simondon gives. A system of stable equilibrium is one that has attained the highest level of homogeneity and the lowest level of potential energy, such that it can no longer transform itself. By contrast, a metastable equilibrium harbors potential um, that can be actualized under the condition of slight changes of the system's parameters. So, for example, a change in temperature or in pressure. Simondor looks at the particular case of introducing a seed into a supersaturated solution. He calls internal resonance the resulting state of tension and forced communication between the supersaturated solution <coughs> charged with potential energy and the seed as a singularity initiating an emergence of structure. The genesis of the individual crystal comes about through operations of successive structurings that occur at its surface, whereby each completed layer of the crystal lattice serves as the organizing base for the next one. Simondon uses the term transduction to describe the progressive expansion of structure within the system. He transfers this transductive operation by means of analogy to other domains as well. I quote, by transduction we mean an operation physical, biological, mental, social, by which an activity propagates itself from one element to the next within a given domain." Unquote. However, Simondon takes care to distinguish processes of transduction in the domain of the living 
from those concerning physical systems. There are chronological and topological differences, as well as differences in the receptivity of information and the revolution of initial incompatibility. In the case of the crystal, the transductive operation is carried out at the surface. Only the crystal's outer layer reacts with the solution. As Simondon says, I quote, it is the limit of the individual which is in the present, unquote. The crystal's interior is the result of past activity. It remains closed up on itself and no longer plays any role in the operation of transduction. This is why Simondon states that, I quote, the words interiority and exteriority do not apply in their usual sense to this reality which is the crystal, unquote. By contrast, a living individual is entirely contemporaneous with itself. Its interiority is in constant exchange with the exterior milieu and through the permeable and polarized membrane. The interior space of the living being plays an important role for the perpetuation of individuation. <coughs> I quote, all the content of the interior space is topologically in contact, in contact with all the content of the exterior space at the limits of the living being. There is in fact no distance in topology, unquote. According to Simondon, there is thus a specific chronotopology associated with the living system. Moreover, one of the characteristics of the living being is the permanence of individuation. It constantly encounters problems that necessitate a solution, and it solves problems not merely by adapting itself to an outer milieu, but by actively modifying the milieu and its own internal structures. The living individual, I quote, carries an inner problematic and can enter as an element into a problematic that is larger than its own being. Unquote. As Simondon points out, there is a moment of invention in the resolution of problems, a creative activity that relies on a sense of time, on past experiences and future anticipations. In the case of the crystal, however, the event that triggers the individuation occurs only once, with the introduction of the seed in, into the supersaturated solution. In other words, information is received once and it marks the beginning of the transductive process. The internal resonance between the two different orders of magnitude, potential energy and structural seed, and the progressive propagation of structure. The crystal grows until the potential energy of the supersaturated solution is exhausted. It can continue its growth in a new supersaturated solution. However, new molecular layers always preserve the same characteristics. The periodic structure of the crystal is only iterated. So there's no sign of creative activity or invention. Therefore, the notion of a problematic field does not really apply in the case of the crystal, as the crystal is not endowed with a capacity of invention or a sense of time. From these examples, we can see that Simondon's notion of transduction is case-specific. Transductive operations are always singular. They are distinguished from one another with, re with regard to the distinct chronological and spatial dynamisms that individuate a system, the system sensitivity to information, and the specific capacity of resolving internal incompatibility. Yet Simondon confers on, trend of on transduction the status of an epistemological and ontological principle. So I quote, it is therefore a notion that is both metaphysical and logical. It applies to ontogenesis and is ontogenesis itself, unquote. Transduction explains and indeed is the becoming of being, or in more scientific terms, the defacing of being. <coughs> I quote, 
Transduction is the correlative appearance of dimensions and structures in a being of pre-individual tension. That is to say, in a being that is more than unity and more than identity and that has not yet defaced itself into multiple dimensions. Simondon's ontogenetic theory of the becoming of being, according to which, um, so is a, is a theory of the becoming of being according to which being is pre-individual. It precedes any individual subject or object. It is never one. I quote, unity and identity only apply to one of the phases of being posterior to the operation of individuation, unquote. He explains pre-individual being through the term metastability. I quote, original being is not stable, it is metastable, unquote. Operations of individuation thus occur in a metastable field endowed with tensions, incompatibilities or disparities. <coughs> a concrete individual is not a being accomplished once and for all, but rather a relational being in a twofold sense. It is related to the pre-individual mode of being from which it emerges and to the milieu in which it lives and which harbors potentials for further individuation. Strictly speaking, the result of individuation is never an individual, but rather the pair individual milieu. <coughs> the mode of existence of individual being can thus be characterized through its relationality. Need to have another sip of water. Still have a cold, so sorry. <coughs> For Simondon, all relations have the rank of being. The relation is a modality of being, he says. It is simultaneous, simultaneous to the terms for which it ensures the existence. Unquote. Relations in Simonon's sense are not external relations. So they are not relations that already exist between constituted individuals. Nor are they mere accidents attributed to a substance. Rather, they are internal relations, tensions, incompatibilities, or disparities. They concern a state of disparation within dynamic systems. Simondon defines relation as, I quote, a constitutive, energetic, and structural condition that prolongs itself in the existence of constituted beings, unquote. However, as Muriel Combe points out, I quote, we must avoid extracting a general statement from it of the type being is relation. For this would undermine the central postulate wherein a theory of individuation always and necessarily proceeds from cases. We may say then that relation constitutes the being of the physical individual, of the living being, of the psychic subject and so on, in a manner that is in each instance singular. There exists, however, a certain number of characteristics common to operations of individuation as a whole, without which there would be no sense in attempting a study of individuation of the sort that Simono undertakes." Unquote. So I come to the second section of the paper, Traces of Simondonian Thought in Difference and Repetition. What is the appeal of Simondon's theory of individuation for Deleuze? In this section, I will focus on four main contributions that Simondon's thought makes to Deleuze's transcendental empiricism, some of which are more important than others. So first, a genetic method and the concept of disparation. Second, the notions of the problematic and of pre-individual singularity. Third, the conception of intensive fields of individuation. And fourth, an aesthetics of intensity, that is, a physical art of signals and signs. As Deleuze says in his 1966 review, Simondon offers a principle that is, I quote, truly genetic and not simply a principle of reflection, unquote. In the logic of sense, he adds that we find in Simondon's philosophy a new conception of the transcendental. Simondon himself is not concerned with the question of transcendental conditions. 
He takes them in the Kantian sense as synonymous with a priori structures that are imposed on a posteriori matter of sensation. A model that for him just replicates the hylomorphic schema at the level of epistemology. I quote Simon Dong. The distinction between a priori and a posteriori, an effect of the hylomorphic schema in the theory of knowledge, masks with its central obscure zone the veritable operation of individuation that is the center of knowledge. Unquote. Just as the model of hylomorphism obscures the individuation of concrete individuals, so this is on the level of ontology, it also obscures the individuation of knowledge and thought at the level of epistemology. Deleuze's engagement with Kant's philosophy goes back to the early 1960s. And from the beginning, he questions precisely this conception of transcendental conditions as given a priori mental structures. In his essay, The Idea of Genesis in Kant's Aesthetics, from 1963, he indicates the way in which the Kantian model of simple conditioning has to be overcome and notes, I quote, that post-Kantians, especially Maimon and Fichte, raised this fundamental objection. Kant neglected the demands of a genetic method. In other words, transcendental conditioning has to be replaced by a transcendental genesis. As we know from his critique of Kant in Difference and Repetition, Deleuze maintains that transcendental conditions must not be conceived as mere concepts of reflection, abstracted from experience and arbitrarily projected as conditions of possibility of objective experience. Kant is, I quote, guilty of elevating a simple empirical figure to the status of a transcendental, at the risk of allowing the real structures of the transcendental to fall into the empirical, unquote. Deleuze searches for a transcendental principle that does not resemble what it conditions, a principle that can give a truly genetic account of real experience. We may say a sufficient reason that functions as a groundless ground. I quote, if sufficient reason or the ground has a twist, this is because it relates what it grounds to that which is truly groundless. We know that for Deleuze, difference is the ultimate reason or more precisely, the publication of ideas made up of differential relations and singular points. Arguably, a major influence in this respect was Salomon Maimon's conception of differential ideas of the understanding that are endowed with a genetic power, a power of production. Yet Maimon maintains the dominance of identity, the identity of an infinite intellect of which the human understanding is but a part. Simonon's conception of three individual being, on the other hand, has renounced the presupposition of unity and identity. Being is more than unity and more than identity. It is a metastable system characterized by a state of disparation. The genetic aspect that Deleuze finds in Simonon is traced to the priority of disparation. It entails two different levels of reality that, when forced into communication, produce a new state of the system, a new dimension of being. As Deleuze puts it in Difference and Repetition, the existence of disparateness involves, I quote, at least two orders of magnitude or two scales of heterogeneous reality between which potentials are distributed. Such a pre-individual field nevertheless does not lack singularities. The distinctive or singular points are defined by the existence and distribution of potentials. An objective pro problematic field thus appears, determined by the distance between two heterogeneous orders. Individuation emerges like the act of solving a problem, or what amounts to the same thing, like the actualization of a potential and the establishing of communication <coughs> between disparates. This brings us to the second point, the notions of the problematic and of pre-individual singularities. In his review of Simondon, Deleuze had pointed to the tremendous importance 
that the category of the problem acquires in Simondon's thought. I quote in so far as the category is endowed with an objective sense. It no longer designates a provisional state of knowledge, an unde undetermined subjective concept, but a moment of being, the first pre-individual moment, unquote. As to the concept of singularities, Deleuze even assigns to Simondon, I quote, the first thought out theory of impersonal and pre-individual singularities. It proposes explicitly, beginning with these singularities, to work out the genesis of the living individual and the knowing subject. It is therefore a new conception of the transcendental, unquote. However, in Deleuze's usage, both conceptions seem to undergo a fundamental <coughs> modification, precisely in so far as they acquire a transcendental status which is not present in Simondon. The first thing to notice is that Deleuze universalizes the notion of the problematic. The problem is no longer, as in Simondon, an incompatibility that a living being encounters within itself or between its own internal structures and the associated milieu. While Simondon uses the notion of the problem with reference to the living being, that perpetuates individuation through the resolution of problems. This reference to the domain of life is not essential for Deleuze. Instead, the problematic is the modality of ideas that are ideal and objective structures. And here we can, of course, see the influence of um, the platonic dialectic of ideas and the Kantian notion of ideas that um, Jeff has already talked about. Ideas are not abstract universals. They stand, I quote, opposed to concepts of the understanding, unquote. Deleuze claims that ideas are concrete universals because they include a multiplicity in themselves and subsume the distribution of distinct and singular points. Hence, what characterizes Deleuze's account of the problematic is its nature as transcendental ideas, structure and multiplicity made up of differential relations and elements that determine the cases of solution. In Simondon, we cannot find anything akin to a dialectic of ideas. Problems occur in the actual historical world and have to be solved by living beings. They have no virtual, universal or structural half. Similarly, Simondon's notion of singularity has an operative function solely within a concrete spatial-temporal system. He employs it with regard to the structural seat which functions as a trigger for individuation in the physical system. Singularities for Simondon are, I quote, historical and local, unquote. In Deleuze's reading, singularities are part of the problem element, which differs in kind from the solution element. They determine the conditions of the problem. In his review of Simondon, when he's discussing the status of singularities distributed in pre-individual beings, Deleuze asks, I quote, is this not the same as in the theory of differential equations, where the existence and the distribution of singularities are of another nature than the individual forms of the integral curves in their neighborhood? Unquote. The theory of singularities as part of the problem element is certainly Deleuze's own creation. Deleuze recasts Simondon's pre-individual being as, I quote, a virtual ideal field made up of differential relations and corresponding singularities. Thus, while his concepts are certainly inspired by Simondon, he takes a further step, not least by employing differential calculus as a way of modeling the sufficiency of the virtual ideal field, which is characterized through the three figures of determinability, reciprocal determination, and complete determination. The virtual problem element is different in kind from the actual solution element. There is a dissimilarity between them as well as a fundamental dissymmetry. By establishing this difference in kind between the dialectic of ideas problems and the co committant cases of solution, Deleuze needs to explain the progressive determination that co-determines the virtual and the actual. At this point, Simondon's theory of individuation provides what would otherwise be a missing link in Deleuze's transcendental empiricism. 
namely the conception of intensive fields of individuation. By defining the idea as structure, I quote, in other words, a system of multiple non-localizable connections between differential elements, which is incarnated in real relations and actual terms, unquote. Deleuze carries over an interpretation of structuralism into his theory of ideas. He claims to have solved the difficulty that this interpretation gives rise to, namely that of reconciling structure and genesis. Indeed, he remarks that, I quote, structuralism seems to us the only means by which a genetic method can achieve its ambitions, unquote. Both structure and genesis seem to be essential elements of his account of <laughs> transcendental empiricism. In his essay, How Do We Recognize Structuralism, from 1967, Deleuze claims that, I quote, structuralism cannot be separated from a new transcendental philosophy in which the sites prevail over whatever occupies them, unquote. An exact parallel to the claim he made for Simonon's work. However, we must avoid conceiving of structure as an invariant formal program of code for production or as a causal factor. If that were the case, Deleuze's fundamental claim about the university of being could not be upheld. There would be a categorical distinction between virtual structures and actual <coughs> instantiations. Deleuze needs to show that univocal being is said of all differences, and he will therefore claim that being is immediately related to individuating differences or intensities, to an intensive field of individuation that precedes and determines processes of, of actualization. Individuating differences are those second degree differences that play the role of the differentiator, the disparate or the dark precursor, also called paradoxical element, aleatory point and empty square in the logic of sense. Um, and I would argue that um, the structuralist resonances are much more emphasized in the logic of sense than in difference and repetition. The task of the individuating differences is to put the first degree differences in relation to one another. While the notion of the dark precursor is very close to Lacan's objet petit a, <coughs> which perpetually displaces and disguises itself within the series of signifiers and signified, the notion of the disparate refers to Simondon and what he describes as spatial-temporal dynamisms within a system. There seems to be a degree of indecisiveness in Deleuze whether to describe this relation of difference to difference by means of difference in terms of structuralism or in terms of Simondon's energetic. In the logic of sense, the structuralist moment is emphasized more, while difference and repetition concentrates on the account of individuating differences in terms of intensive spatial-temporal dynamisms. As Deleuze states in Difference and Repetition, I quote, the state of affairs, that is the relation of difference qua difference, is adequately expressed by certain physical concepts, coupling between heterogeneous series, from which is derived an internal resonance within the system, and from which in turn is derived a forced movement, the amplitude of which exceeds that of the basic series themselves. So you can see these are all terms that Simondon uses. The interpretation in terms of physical concepts seems to be important because it situates the introduction of the notion of intensity, which Deleuze defines as a difference which itself refers to other differences, or a quantity that does not divide without changing in nature and is constantly dividing. Intensity is a crucial element in Deleuze's transcendental empiricism because, I quote, Intensity is the determinant in the process of actualization. It is intensity that dramatizes. It is intensity that is immediately expressed in the basic spatial-temporal dynamisms and determines an indistinct differential relation in the idea to incarnate itself in a distinct quality and a distinguished extensity." Unquote. This clearly shows that structure is not the sole and autonomous source of heterogeneous heterogenesis. Rather, intensity is the agent of a dramatizing operation 
that accounts for the passage from internal to external differences, from an impassive structure to intensive systems. And finally, from these intensive fields of individuation to the entropic and extensive world of representation. Intensive fields of individuation are precisely, I quote, the third thing which determines the idea to actualize itself, to incarnate itself in a particular way, <coughs> unquote. The Simondonian theory of individuation thus provides the mediating third <coughs> thing that Deleuze needs to, to preclude the risk of positing an asymmetrical du duality between virtual structure and actual instantiation that would undermine the notion of the university of being. The total notion of the logic that defines his transcendental empiricism is therefore that of indie drama <coughs> differentiation. <coughs> Simonon's theory of individuation also inspired Deleuze to elaborate an aesthetics of intensity which overcomes the Kantian split between a theory of the sensible and a theory of the beautiful. According to Deleuze, I quote, the two senses of the aesthetic become one to the point where the being of the sensible reveals itself in the work of art while at the same time the work of art appears as experimentation, unquote. For Deleuze, the being of the sensible is intensity. I quote, difference, potential difference and difference in intensity as the reason behind qualitative diversity, unquote. From this world of intensities, effects arise within what will now be called a signal sign system. For instance, in the form of sense or meaning within linguistic systems for a world of speakers. I quote, Every phenomenon flashes in a signal sign system, in so far as the system is constituted or bounded by at least two heterogeneous series, two disparate orders capable of entering into communication, we call it a signal. The phenomenon that flashes across this system, bringing about the communication between disparate series, is a sign." Unquote. We can easily recognize Simondon's influence in this description of the signal sign system. Yet, again, Deleuze goes a step further by extending the Simondonian energetics of physical systems into an aesthetics of intensity. In his transcendental empiricism, aesthetic becomes, I quote, an apodictic discipline, unquote. The functioning of the signal sign system is imperceptible from the point of view of consciousness or recognition. It produces a sense that cannot be explained within the logic of representation. It first arises within, within a sentiendum that gives rise in turn to the cogitandum in the transcendent exercise of the faculty. According to Deleuze's logic of indie drama differentiation, the object of encounter is here an aesthetic idea that is individuated through intensive dynamisms and that expresses itself in the sensible. In his early essay on Kant, the idea of genesis in Kant's aesthetics, Deleuze still referred to the faculty of genius, capable <coughs> of intuiting ideas incarnated in the sensible and of expressing them in a work of art. In Difference and Repetition, Deleuze no longer refers to the intuition of genius but to the transcendent exercise of the faculty. The encounter with pure science raises the faculties to a disjoint transcendent exercise. By going to this extreme limit, sensibility, imagination and thought are able to grasp the world of implicated intensities beyond or behind the entropic and extensive world of representation. What we discover beneath the qualities and extensities of the world of representation are pure signs. I quote, then the most beautiful qualities will appear, the most brilliant colors, the most precious stones, and the most vibrant extensions, unquote. The being of the sensible harbors a physical art of signals and signs, of intensities and forces. The artist is no longer the gifted genius that expresses an idea in his artwork, but rather the artist technician 
who experiments with the materials and captures rhythm of intensity. As Amsa puts it, I quote, the work of art is an experimentation with the sensible, on the sensible, because it brings about a creation of sense on the plane of the sensible and because it compels thought, unquote. It is arguably this aesthetic of intensity that Deleuze pursues in many subsequent works, in the book on Francis Bacon, the cinema books, as well as his collaborative work with Guattari. However, I would argue that in these subsequent books, the aesthetics of intensity is to some extent naturalized. It rather borrows from a Deleuzean Spinozist materialism, insofar as it favors the notion of hexaities, <coughs> which are defined kinetically and topologically. I quote, hexaities consist entirely of relations of movement and rest between molecules or <coughs> particles, capacities to affect and to be affected, unquote. In difference and repetition, Deleuze is still committed to intensive quantity understood as a transcendental principle of individuation and virtual ideas understood as differential structure as, as differential structural multiplicity. So I come to the last section, the problem of method. In the previous section, I pointed out some divergences between Simondon and Deleuze in the understanding and use of certain concepts. The starkest difference between the two thinkers lies arguably in their respective methods. Simondon calls a theory of individuation allegmatic, by which he means a theory of operations. I quote, Operation is that which makes a structure appear or which modifies a structure, unquote. As Simondon admits, it is difficult to specify an operational structure, I quote, if not by way of example, unquote. There is an abundance of examples in, Simondon, in Simondon's book. So he's talking about the molding of a brick, crystallization, about particle physics, the reproduction of marine organisms such as coral reefs. And as we have seen, he uses crystallization as the main paradigm for his theory of individuation. By what right can a physical paradigm be transposed to other domains, the domain of life, the mind, the social? Simondon is fully aware of the implicit risk of what he is doing, namely reducing those other domains to the purely physical. I quote, we have tried to draw a paradigm from the physical sciences, thinking that it can be transposed to the domain of the living individual. Presupposing that there are diverse degrees of individuation, we used the physical paradigm without effectuating a reduction of the vital to the physical, unquote. Simonon always has this very cautious uh, formulation. Simodor explains his method as a new type of analogical paradigmatism and points to Plato's sophist as an illustration of this method. The analogical act in Plato's sophist consists in using a paradigm that is well known, for example, fishing, in order to understand another particular structure that is unknown, so in that case, the sophist. But instead of examining particular structures and trying to determine their resemblance, what is actually compared, compared are real operations, the activity of fishing and the recruiting of rich young people. According to Simondon, the analogical method implies an abstraction from the end terms of the relation. This is how it reveals, I quote, an identity of relations, unquote. The fundamental idea is to gain knowledge, and I quote, by defining structures through the operations that determine them dynamically, instead of defining operations through the structures between which they obtain, unquote. Simonon criticizes pseudosciences that make <coughs> use of, as he says, confused images based on resemblance. For instance, he looks critically at the attempt to identify living beings and self-regulated technical objects, as in the work of certain cyberneticians. I quote Simondon, external analogies, or rather resemblances, must be rigorously banned. 
they have no signification and are only misleading." Unquote. True analogy only concerns, I quote, an operative and functional analogy between the original domain and the domain of application of the paradigm. Unquote. Simondon realizes, however, that the analogical method requires an ontological <coughs> postulate. Otherwise, it would just amount, as he says, to an association of ideas. I quote, the analogy between two beings conceived by thought is only legitimate <coughs> if thought itself sustains an analogical relation with the operative schemas of each of the represented beings. Unquote. In other words, knowledge or thought itself has to be individuated. And this logical operation must be, quote, modulated by the systematic ensemble of essential operations that constitute being, unquote. One can say that the foundation of knowledge is a dynamic analogy, or as he puts it in um, his secondary thesis, a relation of isodynamism between real processes in being and in thought. Thought has to follow the genesis of being, and it can only do so by individuating itself. As Simondon puts it succinctly, therefore it is neither immediate nor mediate knowledge that we can have of individuation, but a knowledge that is an operation that runs parallel to the known operation. We cannot know individuation as it is commonly understood. We can only individuate, individuate ourselves and individuate in us. This insight is in the margins of what's properly called knowledge, an analogy between two operations, which is a certain mode of communication." Unquote. As a consequence of this analogical method of ontological and ontological postulate, Simondon's theory of individuation retains a somewhat incomplete and hypothetical character. As Muriel Combe points out, I quote, we cannot claim to study individuation in general. We are always dealing only with singular cases of individuation, which complicates the task of a global theory of individuation." Unquote. The physical paradigm cannot reveal some ultimate universal logic of individuation. The paradigm has to be put to the test. The notion of transduction that Simondon elaborates on the basis of his case studies can only attain a comparative universality one that is based, I quote, on a certain number of characteristics common to operations of individuation as a whole, unquote. Simondon's analogical method can only claim some legitimacy by invoking a generalized Bexonian method of intuition that relies on the capacity of thought to accompany the individuation of beings by means of its own coming into being. So this is the last section now. Turning um, to Deleuze, it seems that he follows a totally different approach. Not only does he ban analogy as a method of representational thinking, he also objects to proceeding by means of paradigms. A transcendental philosophy, in the sense that he intends to construct it, cannot trace the transcendental from the <coughs> empirical. Simonon's theory of individuation is definitely borrowed from the scientific literature of his day and its empirical examples, in particular physical chemistry and thermodynamics. While it is tempting to read Deleuze as if he too put forward intensity as an empirical principle, he is explicit in his statement that, I quote, intensive quantity is a transcendental principle, not a scientific concept, unquote. As such, intensive quantity does not govern any particular domain, but first gives rise to different domains and assigns an empirical principle to them. This is also the reason why Deleuze can call the scientific principle of entropy an illusion. I quote, only transcendental inquiry can discover that intensity remains implicated in itself and continues to envelop difference at the very moment when it is reflected in the extensity and the quality that it creates which implicated only secondarily, just enough to explicate it." Unquote. For Deleuze, 
intensive quantity remains implicated in the pure spatium or depth. It cannot be cancelled out and provides a constant source of transformation and metamorphosis. I quote, while the laws of nature govern the surface of the world, the eternal return ceaselessly rumbles in this other dimension of the transcendental or the volcanic spatium, unquote. The laws of transcendental empiricism, in spite of the empiricism in the phrase, follows a speculative and constructive method which links it to an idealist tradition of philosophy. The logic of indie drama differentiation gives an account of the dramatization of virtual ideas in the depth of an intensive spatium. This is why Deleuze can ultimately claim that, I quote, everybody, everything, 